I uh, trust you had a good Thanksgiving. Therese and uh, Sammy, I dropped them off in Cleveland for the airport last Monday. They were in Colorado hanging out with Teresa's sister, picking up Nathan. He'll be joining us back. Uh, he's done. This program only lasted uh, semester. But looking forward to them coming back this past uh, or this coming uh, week. We've had a good time of junk food and videos and all those things that Teresa, you know, the moms are saying, no, 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 you know, eat what your kids, eat what your mom says, not what your dad says. That's always a good plan. And uh, we had an enjoyable Thanksgiving. We'll pay for it, I'm sure, but we uh, had a good Thanksgiving. This, you know, we're finishing up our series today on soul watchers. And, you know, you're thinking about leadership. Well, let me read you a charter from a, a university that you probably know well. This uh, school started in 1636. Their uh, charter was to be plainly, this is what they told their students, to be plainly, in, and I'm quoting, to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. This guy's again started in 1636. When they started, they hired exclusively Christian pastors. Their number one goal was Christian character formation and equipping ministers to preach the gospel. This was Harvard University. Well, 80 years later, there were some New England pastors who weren't liking the, the direction Harvard was going. You know, this is this kind of life, life cycle for us. And they saw it, and so they contacted a, a, a philanthropist by the name of Elihu Yale, and they explained their concerns, and Elihu Yale uh, uh, was willing to finance their expedition, and they started Yale University with the goal of doing what Harvard was supposed to do, but has faltered. Well, today, they're, obviously, their academic excellence is still very high, but on the Christian side of things, they have fallen off the map. Their schools are not at all doing what their founders intended them to do. As a matter of fact, at the 350th anniversary for Harvard, uh, Steve Muller, he was the former president of Johns Hopkins, he said this. He said, the bad news is Harvard has become godless. Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard, said this. He said, things divine have been central neither to my professional nor to my personal life. And it's fascinating when the school started off as they did, and then the president in time came to say, it has zero part in my life. As the leader goes, so goes the organization. Now, Harvard was going the wrong way 80 years after they started. It wasn't all Larry Summers' fault. But it makes you stop and say, as far as the church goes, we've seen churches, we've seen denominations, we've seen people who started off with one mission, with one charter, and they really kind of slid. What, would it, what is it that protects us from doing the exact same thing? Are we so much better than everybody else? What is it that would keep us from going the same Route. And so what we want to do this, this morning is we want to stop and look at Jesus' plan for leadership. And his church especially, but generally speaking. So if you turn with me in your Bibles, John chapter 13. And I trust you brought your Bible, John chapter 13. And we're going to we're jump right in. Let me give you a little context, though. Jesus' public ministry just ended. It just, just was done. He's turning his full focus towards his disciples. This is the beginning. This is the upper room discourse. You know, they, they uh, are in town for the Passover. Jesus is, is, is having this with his disciples right here. The very next day, he's going to go through his trials and be crucified. They don't know that. Jesus does, but they don't. But 13.1... It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. You know, it's, time is up. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Your text may say he loved them to the end. That, that phrase has been kind of debated but as far as what it really means. But it seems that what it means is this. Jesus is saying that at this point, he's up in the upper room, he's going to give a special manifestation of his love. He's going to demonstrate the fullness of his love 
to his disciples. So whatever happens here, in Jesus' mind, this is a full demonstration of his love to his disciples. It's a good thing to, to keep in mind. Um, verse 2, it says that the evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now, foot washing was protocol. We don't really, people walk into our house, we don't say, take off your shoes, let me wash your feet. I'm not going to go visit that guy's house anymore, right? That, well, that's not, that's alien here. But here it was very, very uh, much protocol. It was just normal. And part of the reason, again, is the folk, their shoes were just really a piece of leather on the bottom. Their, their soles very thin, tied with some leather straps. And there were no paved roads, of course, right? So, uh, especially in this part of the world, it's very dusty. Their feet got dirty really easy. And if it rained, uh, the no paved roads ended up becoming mud swamps and their feet got very muddy. And the fact that there's not a lot of automobiles at this point in history. And so if you traveled and you didn't walk, if you walked, your feet would be very sore because you're on uh, very rough terrain, often getting from one place to the next, not a whole lot of roads. But if you're walking through the streets where are, there are donkeys and horses and camels and lots of sheep, you probably are stepping in a lot of stuff you really don't want to step in. But no one really thought about that. And so when you came into someone's home, it was real important that your feet were washed. Also, the, the feet were often... Uh, wounded, as you can imagine. They're beat up. They're walking on the rough terrain. They're banging into rocks. People are stepping on it, stubbing the toes, scratches, scrapes, bruised. They're just very sore. So when you came into someone's house and, and the, 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 the servant was there and he washed your feet, it was soothing. It was refreshing. It was besides the hygiene issue. Uh, they, they, it was now we're ready to, to enjoy fellowship with each other. So it was this normal protocol. Now, the, the rabbis said that a Jewish slave could not wash feet, though, because of all the stuff you're touching. You're touching open wounds. You're touching the blood. You're, you're touching manure. You're, you're touching all these things that would make you ceremonially unclean, unfit before God. You, you, so a Jewish person, a Jewish slave could not do it. A Gentile slave had to do it. And you can imagine all the slaves in the household who wants to wash slimy, manure-coated, bloody feet, you always made the new guy do it. Say, this is the lowest guy in the totem pole, the youngest one. He was the one to do this job. And so when the disciples came to that upper room that night, and there was the basin and the water and the towel right there, it's not like they walked by going, probably do this, but I'm going to let someone else do it. They weren't even thinking this. Because a Jewish person couldn't touch the stuff on the feet. It was, you couldn't do that. It would make you ceremonially unclean. The rabbi said we couldn't. And so they just went their way. You couldn't pull that off. And so when Jesus decides to do this. Now Peter knows who Jesus is. Remember Peter, Jesus said, who am I? And, Jesus, and what did Peter say? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter knows who created the world. Jesus guy. And who, who walked on the water and, and, and all the things that they saw, but also who, who knocked on Abraham's front door and who appeared to Moses in the burning bush and, and who holds all things together. It's Jesus. It's God. And so when God decides to touch those slimy feet and all of those things that will separate you from God, and Peter's going, whoa, hang on, wait a minute, I can't, this is, the gears are grinding, I don't understand, hang on, wait a second, this, you can't do this. This is a horrific thing. This is embarrassing. You, Jesus, do you know what's on my feet? And Jesus, this is a picture. See, see here's, here's the issue. Jesus knows he's going to die tomorrow. But he knows his disciples aren't ready for that. 
They, they, they're not thinking that. The, the disciples, remember, they just a couple days ago, they came into to town, Jerusalem, and all the pilgrims were in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was swelling, and all the people, the name on everyone's tongue was Jesus. Because Jesus had turned up his miracles and his teaching and his attacks on the rabbis within the last few months even. And word was on the street was this could be the Messiah. And so when Jesus comes into town, he'd always been quiet about this. He poo-pooed it. But, but they form a parade and Jesus comes through town saying in so many different ways, yes, I am the Messiah and I'm here. And so all the people are like, ah. Jesus, Jesus, he's the one. They're ready to anoint this guy king right now. And so all these guys in the upper room are thinking, I know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. We're going to take out Rome. And, and, and Jesus, I mean, he, he raises a dead person. No one can hurt Jesus. And, and he's going to, to raise Israel back to the Solomonic glory days and all of the world will come and bow down at our feet. That's what they're thinking. Jesus knows that the bigger issue is not Rome, it's hell. And the only way to get victory there is through the cross. And so Jesus knows when they see me hanging on the cross, that's not at all what they're thinking. He's got to do something to get them starting thinking down this way. He also knows that, that tomorrow when he dies, then he'll, he'll ascend a few days after that, 40 days after that, he's going to give these guys the steering wheel to his movement, the church. And he knows these guys are not ready to have the steering wheel. They're going to crash this thing. It's going to end up in the ditch. We got to, see, they, they have got some wild understanding. In Luke 22, it tells us what, in the upper room, what they were talking about here. It says, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. It said, the kingdom's going to be coming in real soon. And who's going to be uh, Jesus' prime minister assistant? And whose name is going to be higher on the org chart? Who's going to get that corner office? And so they're all arguing with you. I'm going to, I deserve it more than you. And so they're all talking and arguing. And then Jesus steps in and he says, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who's greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Now, this kings of the Gentiles things, what Jesus is, is pinpointing is the cultural understanding of leadership. He's saying, you know, uh, the, 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 the kings, as high up as you can get, they exercise authority. They're, they're at the top of the org chart. And the disciples are going, yeah, that's right. That's real authority, top of the org chart. He's saying these guys that, that are claimed to be the benefactors, the leaders, the shepherds of the people, they're the ones at the top. They're the ones exercising the authority. And the disciples are going, yeah, authority. And Jesus says, you got a wrong paradigm. You can't take into the church what's going out in the, the business world per se. We've got to tweak this a little bit. Because the way up is not up. The way up is down. You meet me on the lowest rung, not at the top rung. He's not talking about abusive leadership here. He doesn't say that this is evil tyrants who are demeaning and pejorative and they use the whip and they have scorpion tongues. He's not talking about evil leadership. He's just talking about a secular view of leadership. And the disciples have gravitated to that. Uh, Networking, if you hear that, it's a kind of a catch word these days. It's been around for a while, I suppose. But to network means I make connections with people who can help me. And they might not help me right now, but I'm connecting with them. I'm building a relationship with them so that one day they might be able to get me in the right place or buy this whatever for me or take care of that or resource that thing or, or, or introduce me to somebody else. They're networking. Uh, we, we network geese who may be able to lay golden eggs for us. Now, people who would lay tin eggs for us, do we network with them? Folk who can't help us out at all, do we network with them? I mean, it's not, not that we hate them or anything, but we're not going to show them the attention that we need to be shown. See, I'm not saying that networking is bad. But you know as well as I do that where personal advancement is concerned, integrity has a very short shelf life, right? 
and things can go, motivation can go sideways in a hurry with personal advancement. Jesus introduces servant leader, what's servant leadership. And again, that's the business world has grabbed onto that. It's not a bad thing. You treat your employees well. You care for them, and you, you're not heavy-handed. You help them develop an advancement plan, and you give them a chair at decision table a little bit, and you let them control some of their environment, and you treat them nice. Now, the reason why this is done, though, is not necessarily purely benevolence. It's done because study after study has determined that if you treat these guys nice, you know what happens? The bottom line gets bigger, and the organization gets healthier. And, and you're able to retain quality employees longer. And so you do this because it helps these geese to lay bigger golden eggs. So ultimately, again, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. We can make sure. He's, Jesus is not saying this is bad. It's not a bad thing. Because if you don't do some of this right, then the stockholders go away and the company crumbles and all the employees are out of a job. Who wants all of that? But Jesus is saying, in the church, you've got to make sure you have a different paradigm your minds he's, he's addressing this this issue here of of using people for personal advancement that's what he's addressing and you, you can't you can't go down that road so i gotta gotta give you a picture that's when he started washing the feet and again simon said man I, I, oh i can't this makes no sense jesus i, I can't do you, you can't do this and Jesus' answer to him is, unless I cleanse you, you have no part with me. Saying, Peter, it's not about you trying harder, and it's not about you being sincere, and it's not about you trying not to step in anything. I have to cleanse you, or you have no part in me. That's powerful. How many folk do you know trying to get to him by doing the good stuff, doing the right stuff, doing the right, and they're going to try harder. They're going to be more sincere. They're, but they've never come to him for cleansing. Let me ask you, have you ever come to him for cleansing? Because it's not about you have this. Jesus says, unless I cleanse you, you have no part with me. Peter wasn't a bad guy, but Jesus still had to cleanse him. And so then Peter, typical Peter, verse 9, he says, And the Lord, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Just give me the whole deluxe bath thing. I'll take everything. And Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. This is important. Jesus is giving them a, a, a second meaning, double meaning here. He's saying, I have to cleanse you. Starts there. But then Peter, after you've been cleansed by me, you don't need a whole washing again. In other words, let me back up. For us, we believe once you come to know Christ, the Bible says that moment when you surrender your life to Christ, Jesus has died for your past, your, your present, and your future sins, and they are all washed away. They're all washed away. You can do nothing to separate yourself from Christ. He will never leave you or forsake you. You're set positionally in heaven. You're perfect. There's nothing you can do about that. You're there. But in this world, as we walk through this world, we pick up stuff. We step in things. And there needs to be a cleansing because that interrupts the relationship. It's like my dad when I was a kid growing up. He's my dad. But if he told me to do something and I didn't do it or I lied to him or I did something that separated, then when I got in his presence, I knew that in my heart. I felt and we just didn't have the relationship we, we, we could have until I put it on the table and I asked for forgiveness and I reminded him of his love for me, and he graciously gave me that forgiveness. First John 1 9, written to Christians, says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just, and he'll forgive us. Our sins. So we need, and this is what Jesus is saying, as you go through life, you need that cleansing. Please don't think, all right, I accepted Christ there, I'm all done, everything's fine, now it's all about me trying harder and me being sincere. Trying hard and being sincere is good, but we need regularly to go to him for cleansing. We need regularly. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you don't. I need regularly 
to come to him and say, Lord, I blew it. Please, would you forgive me? He does. He does. But he has to cleanse us. He has to. This is Peter Steele. Then said when he had finished washing their feet, he put on clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. And now I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. But we know everybody doesn't want to wash feet. You know, it's not, maybe they don't look good in a towel. You know, they look better in the, in the, the, the purple designer robes. You know, say, I don't do feet. You know, I do a lot, I'll do a lot, but I don't do feet. That's not what I'm, I'm, I'm about. There's somebody here in the church who doesn't do feet. It's important that we look at him for just a second because in his heart, he betrays the key reason why those who don't wear the towel won't wear the towel. This is Judas. Good old Judas. You know, we never want to name our children after Judas, do we? I've, heard, I've, heard, I've seen a lot of Bible names, all kinds of strange Bible names used for kids. But I've never heard anyone say, you know, my wife and I, we really like Judas. It's got a good ring to it. We think that our kid, you'll just hopefully he'll grow up and be like Judas. Ah, really? No, no, no. It's not, it's not, he's a mean guy. He's the scoundrel of Scripture. We don't like Judas. He's not a good one. Now, Judas... Here at this upper room, it's fascinating stuff, and we're not going to get into it a whole lot. But Judas is given the seat of, of, of honor. It, it, the, the, the seating, they kind of laid on their left side, they, the table, and they kind of, when their feet were kind of going out. We know John was sitting on the right of Jesus. Now, we'll know that in just a second. Well, because it says that John leans into the breast of Jesus, so he's on the right. Judas, we know, is on the left because Jesus is going to feed Judas. The left is the seat of honor. You didn't choose that for yourself. Jesus chose who was going to be there, who would sit in it. So you can imagine that night. Jesus knows what's going on. Jesus knows that you know, Judas has already got the silver in his pocket, is jangling. And Jesus knows what's happening. And Jesus is looking around going, ah, Judas, yeah. Judas, why don't you come to the seat of honor? Imagine Judas. <laughs> no, no, I think that, you know, right here at the end is great for me. Right, I'm feeling sick. I might need to leave. No, 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 Judas. Judas, I want you right here. Okay. Judas is, is in the seat of honor. And then when Jesus washes the feet, he comes to Judas. He doesn't bypass Judas. He comes to Judas. Can you imagine what Judas is thinking? And there's Jesus just... Their faces are a foot apart. God Almighty kneeling at the feet of Judas, washing his feet. So he's saying, it's a sign of love. Remember Jesus said, this is a sign of, of deep love. And what he's saying is, Judas, you don't have to do this. No word. This is good. You don't have to do this. And what's going to happen later on in verse 20, you know, these guys are going to be arguing about being the greatest, and then Jesus is going to say, you guys are all clueless. One of you is going to betray me. Now, can you imagine how Judas's heart starts cranking up a little bit once, once Jesus puts that on the table? Whoa, what does he know? What doesn't he know? You know, their heart starts cranking. One of you will betray me. And they go around the table. Not I, not I, not I. And Judas, too, because he doesn't want to look out of place. Not I, Lord. God, because Jesus is right next to him, says, and, and, and then what's going to happen is Peter starting to get nervous. Maybe it's me. So he says to John, who's right next to Jesus, hey, ask him who he's talking about. So John leans over to Jesus and said, who are you talking about? And Jesus says, I'm going to assume that this is a quiet conversation because no one else knew it. He tells John, Person, I take the bread, dip it, morsel, dip it into the sauce, put it in their mouth. They're the one. So he takes the bread, sticks it to Judas. Of love, he's him, the person of love. To do, to do this. 
as, as we think about Judas for a minute, Judas is a wild character, isn't he? I mean, Judas had the best small group experience you could ever have. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, anyone have a bad small group experience, but Judas had a good, this was perfect small group experience. Jesus, had, uh, Jesus was his discipler. Judas had the absolute best disciple. Can you imagine a better discipler than Jesus? Jesus had it. Jesus had the best preacher. Jesus had, Jesus, Judas had the best mentoring, pouring into experience anybody could have. Anybody could have except for the other 11. Not only that, but Judas had the best church experience because Jesus chose Judas to be the treasurer where his gifts would be. Uh, Judas was in his sweet spot. Judas preached the gospel and saw people's lives changed. Judas cast out demons. Judas watched Jesus walk on water and do miracles. And Judas had every possible... Sometimes we say, well, if I just had a good disciple or see, then I could grow. But not necessarily. Judas had it all. It's a hard thing. And see, there was something else in Judas's heart it kind of blocked it. Mindset, you know, I don't, I don't do feet. Don't, don't, I don't look good in a towel. I'm not going on that road. I, I like the old paradigm of leadership better, Jesus. Thank you very much. Here's a question. Why did you, I mean, you might say, well, Satan put this in Judas's heart. Come on, Mark. Judas was kind of a victim of some spiritual thing. And, you know, just in God's sovereignty, somebody had to deny Jesus. And, you know, it stinks to be Judas. But, you know, I guess he has someone had to do it. So he pulled the, drove the small stick somehow. Don't, don't demonize this guy yet. There's no prophecy said that says that Judas had to be the one to do this. Uh, back in Matthew 16, remember what Jesus says to Peter? When Peter says, oh, Jesus, you won't die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Let's not just say that Judas was an incarnate somebody out of hell yet. But still, Satan did place this in his heart. Verse 2. Why do you think did Satan choose Judas? Why didn't he place it in the heart of Matthew or Andrew or John? Why did he pick Judas? Chapter 12, this is the, the, just before this, uh, Jesus is in Bethany, and uh, Mary anoints his feet costly perfume. And, and when she does, Judas looks at what transpired. I don't know if we've got... Judas Iscariot, who's later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Now, that sounds like a noble thing, right? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put inside it. Uh, Judas's words sound very spiritual, don't they? They sound... That's, that makes sense. You have to beware sometimes of folk who sound too spiritual. Because sometimes what we have a tendency to do is cover our sin with spiritual language. I mean, our hearts might even be deceived here. We just want our agenda. We want to win. We want, we want our thing. We want our preference. We want, and so we cover it with nice religious sounding jargon. But the bottom line is we don't wear, and wear a towel. We're not going to kneel at anyone's feet. They should kneel at ours. That's the mindset. That's what Judas's mindset was. And, and it's interesting, Scripture doesn't say, now you've got to just take this as a grain of salt, but Scripture doesn't say he didn't, didn't place this, Satan didn't place this in the heart of Matthew and Andrew and Philip. He might have. It didn't take root there, though. But you need to know that this one thing that Judas was doing that he didn't think anybody else knew about, obviously the Holy Spirit knew about it, we got it in the text, but also Satan knew about it. It's one thing that Judas thought he was getting away with. Satan looked around and said, ah, Judas's heart is ready for this. And so Satan put this idea into his heart and it took root. And let me just kind of parenthetical note here for just a second. If you're messing around with something that you think no one else knows, you've got to know heaven knows, but you also need to know that hell knows. And you're opening yourself up for other stuff 
You're not just getting it. You're playing on Satan's playground, whether it's watching stuff you know you shouldn't be watching, no one else is going to, or you're getting too close emotionally to somebody that you shouldn't be getting close to, or you're, you're neglecting something that you know you shouldn't be neglecting, you're, you're, you're spinning the truth a little bit too much, you're loose with the facts, whatever, whatever it is that you think you're getting away with, you got to know Satan is smiling. And he's knowing that the condition of your heart, and there'll be a time when he'll stick something in your heart too, that, that, that you would think, I would have never have done this. I don't know what happened. Well, Satan knew. And so Judas, those feet that Jesus watched, walk away from Jesus. So there's Judas, sitting at Epstein's bar and grill, corner table, window seat, eating the finest Epicurean delights that a Jewish first century guy can eat. Uh, he's dreaming of when he gets to this, his beach house off the Mediterranean and, and is this going to be a wonderful experience? And he's thinking about those 11 uh, poor slobs and they're going to, you know, they're getting all kinds of trouble, man. They're following Jesus. They got to wear a towel for crying out loud. And, you know, they're all going to be kicked out of the synagogue and their families are going to disown them and some of them are going to die. And we look at this and we go, well, Judas didn't choose the wrong thing. But Paul Harvey would say, well, that's not the end of the story, right? We know, Matthew 27, what happens? And Judas is there and he sees Jesus being pulled, his hands bound in trial. Suddenly, Judas is like his eyes are opened. He realizes what, what happened. When Judas, who betrayed him, saw Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, that's your problem. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Reality is that each of us will see Jesus at the end. And those things that we traded following him for, those things that we had to have that Jesus was going to get in the way of, of us getting, those things that we had to get, we're going to loathe. We're going to see them for what they, they were. We're going to see them how they condemned us. We thought they would bring us joy, but those are the things that stole our lives. And we're going to want nothing to do with them. Now, Judas went and hanged himself. He didn't have to do that. He could have cast himself on the grace that Jesus had kept offering him. And again, if you're there, and you've decided, towel is not for me, man. I'm not going that way. I want the way of the kings of the Gentiles. You've got your silver. You can come to him for the forgiveness, for the hope. So... Feet, washing feet. What does that do for us today? Why is that here? I mean, Jesus, that was important for them. We realize dirty feet, so that the dirty. All right, what does that mean for us? Well, feet, a couple of things. First of all, you know, survey after survey after survey tells us that the most unsightly part of your body is your feet. Yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, it's, it's we're not washing people's uh, feet based on their smile or their eyes, or their hair, or their dimples, or, or, you know, people who might be attractive to us, or charismatic, or because their tongue is so smooth. It, it's not because their physique or their figure. Bottom line is, if you take away most people from their ankles up, and all, you take away any pedicure and fancy toe polish and anklets, most feet are just feet. They're just kind of there. And basically, everybody is the same. And I think what it would say for us, and the principle that Jesus has here for us is... When we serve, we don't serve just those we gra gravitate to. We don't serve just those who, who uh, can give us something, those who make us feel a certain way, those who we deem as nice and kind. Jesus washed the feet of Judas, for crying out loud. We, we, we wash the feet regardless. It's a selfless, selfless. This is the first principle we find, I think, here. A, a second deal we see about feet is I think feet, again, were those that, things that were damaged and hurt and stepped on and pained. 
Second principle that we draw is we wash with sensitivity. We recognize everybody has been hurt. Often, though, we have our shoes on and socks, and nobody knows the pain. We keep it hidden. Nobody knows. We don't really let it out, and maybe that's okay. But Jesus would say, everybody got pain. And so when you wash them, serve them, you do it with sensitivity and kindness. You're not rough with the sheep. Also with... with we, we see that that's, uh, uh, they would be filthy, I guess the best way to say it here. We don't want to miss this picture because it's so easy today for us to say, oh, your feet are fine. Ah, your feet don't yet. No, your feet are great. Listen, if you see my feet, everyone's feet, I'm telling you, your feet are good. The goal of spiritual leadership is to wash people's feet. It's to Help remove those things that keep them from knowing God on a deeper level. It's, it's being sensitive. It's being humble. You're kneeling at their feet. You're, you're uh, uh, caring for. But still, you're bold enough to say, you know, this is sin. You, this is going to destroy you. Would you allow me to help you meet Jesus who can cleanse you? That's the goal. Spiritual leadership. And, of course, with deepest humility. Wearing the towel. Kind of embarrassing to do. Now, it's amazing to me when I think of God, Jesus, kneeling at our feet to cleanse them. Very humbling. Very humbling thing. If, if Jesus was here, we'd say, I don't mind washing your feet, Jesus, but we'd be kind of like Peter, but you're not, you're not you're gonna wash mine. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too... But we have to come to him. When Jesus ends this, verse 17, I don't even have this one on the screen, but he says, Now that you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Just knowing this stuff is not the issue. We, know, we probably know way more than we're ever going to apply. But blessed are you if you do them. If you do them, then you're going to meet me because Jesus is hanging out on that bottom rung, not the top rung. So husbands, the last time you wash your wife's feet, not physically, but metaphorically. Parents, your kids, older brother or sister, the last time you washed your feet, siblings or do they really exist for you not the other way around just would say it's the other way around employers last time you walked the feet of your employees project managers last time you walked the feet of your direct reports let's get more specific church elders wanna leaders Sunday school teachers not just their babysitting you wash those kids Nursery workers to wash the feet, those little guys. Mops table leaders, finance team folk, custodians, greeters, coffee people. This is our, this is our, our task. This is what he call, has called us to do. This is, uh, you follow my example. Now that you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. So what we're going to do right uh, now, in just a moment, is we're going to... Uh, have several people from the congregation, they know who they are already, come on up, be seated in a chair, and then several elders will come forward and wash their feet as a symbol, a sign that we desire in our, in our leadership to follow Jesus. It's a reminder to them, it's a reminder to us that this is what leadership is about.